the, the Sunday after the Christchurch massacre, I was speaking at a church and, and, um, and I started with, so do you think Muslims are your brothers and sisters? Right? And I, and I said, don't answer that because you might be stepping in a trap. <laughs> yeah, it's a rhetorical question. And I said, if, if you think they're not, then you know something that Paul the Apostle didn't. <laughs> right? Because on a couple different occasions, he said, like, from, uh, glory be to God, from the Father, from whom every tribe and nation derives its origin. Name. Name origin. More origin. Yeah, and identity. Wow. Yeah. Identity. Identity. Because name is identity. And, um, and then uh, I used Mars Hill the, in Acts 15, 13, somewhere in that vicinity. 17, 17 thank you. So um, that's where Paul gets up in front of the Greek pagans, right? If there's any in us versus them, this is it. He's a, he's a Jew now facing the Gentiles in its rawest form. And he's talking to them about a God that they that they have a, an idol to, but they don't know who it is. And, um, and he says some amazing things, like he says, you are all God's children. Right? Again, saying the same thing. That, our, that you won't meet a person whose family of origin is not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, um, so, and then he says, and this is the wild one, uh, because he quotes the hymn to Zeus. And, and if you've seen the two models of, of the Trinitarian reality of the great dance and cent the centrality of relationship versus the God behind Jesus that Jesus came to save us from, that God is Zeus and Marduk and Baal and all the rest of them. And, uh, and he, he quotes the hymn to Zeus, which is one of the Greek poets. And he says, in him you live and move and have your being. Right? So right, he is establishing right off the bat in terms of how we are to perceive ourselves in the world as part of a family that, that most of the participants are unaware that they belong to. And, uh, and that would include Christians, I think. Uh, <laughs> but so, and, and so I said, um, in talking about that Sunday morning, I said, look, according to Paul and according to the the writers of the New Testament, you're surrounded by brothers and sisters. You know, this, this, is, the family, this is the family of God. Because uh, all of creation originates inside the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, um, and then I said, so let's pray for our brothers and sisters who've had this loss in Christ's church. And that changes. As soon as you, you begin to do that, suddenly it's not them it's, it's part of our human family. And humanity is the identity, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's only one race. So humanity is the identity. And so it's not Jew or Greek or slave or free or male or female or any of the other multiple categories that we might create. It's our identities in, inside of our humanity. So you will never meet someone who's not a brother or sister or someone who's not already in Christ which surprises a lot of my people mm -hmm. uh, because we started with the two circles, you know. Um, simple, and you may have talked about this already. Yeah, does this thing work? Uh, does this thing work? In, in the language of Paul's uh, conversation with sure. Smith, yeah. the philosopher in Athens. Yeah, so, yeah. He says, um, we're in him, we move, we live in him, Yes. And then to the Ephesians, he says, God the Father is in us. Yeah. Yeah. In all. He, he, Mark is there. Okay, good. So he turns it around. Cool. He says, in all of in all. He's the Father of all, all in all. all. No. The elect. <laughs> Dude, turns out. Huh? <laughs> so, and. and So, in the other, the other, um, and Baxter really brought this this piece out, and that's in the passage where Paul talks about his Damascus Road experience, 
Did you talk about that? So it's the only time that Paul refers to the Damascus Road experience. He, he's the one telling his own story, right? Everybody else is writing, Luke writes about it and Acts and all this. So they're telling it from a narration point of view. Paul tells it from personal experience. And it's in that, in that uh, list where he says, you know, I was set apart from my mother's womb. And he, and he goes on to talk about how he was breathing threats and murder against, you know. Um, and he says, and, and I don't remember if he says in the fullness of time or at the right time, when, when God was pleased to reveal his son in me, not to me, which is huge, right? It's in me. And so he's saying that the Damascus Road experience did not happen from the outside in. It happened from the inside out. And he says, and now I preach him in the Gentiles, right? So it's in the ethnoi. And it's in that same section where he says, this is what happened to me on the Damascus Road. That God was pleased to reveal his son in me, not to me. And now I preach him in the Gentiles, right? That's a very different point of view. And it's Paul's personal point of view. And he's saying the revelation of Jesus was from the inside out. Um, because we love separation, right? So we have, we have God over here and we have <coughs> creation over here. And, and that's where we get our separation theology. The three things, the three things that religion needs to exist. Separation. It's A, I think. Separ... Is it A? T-I-O-N. Separation, magic, and sacrifice. And even in secular religion, um, I'd have to look up, hold on a second, and I'll tell you what the equivalencies are uh, in, because I jotted them down at one point, so, I w so that I wouldn't forget them. <laughs> there comes a time in your life where jotting things down is very helpful. Um, okay, now I have to find it. Three elements of religion. So here, here in secular religion, This is what they are equivalent to. Um, perfectionism. Um, performance. And productivity. Oh. Now you're meddling. <laughs> well, who's ready for Paul to be done? <laughs> <laughs> And, and what, what violates these are uh, under, the, under the guise of, not the guise, but the, the reality of relationship. We have intimacy. You can see how intimacy counteracts separation, right? You have authenticity. And that would be truth telling. And you have incarnation. So um, um, this would be, this is how a friend of mine puts it. These three would be we, see, and be. Incarnation is being. That's very, that's very vague and very broad, but uh, and we can go, I'll, I'll talk about some of these, especially in, in relationship to how religion works and functions. Because Christianity is a religion. And, and here, here's the secret. God has never been religious, like ever. 
we create religions. God has never had a time where it's like, so, which one of us is in charge of the meeting this weekend, you know, and, and, and where exactly are we going to meet? You know, it's like, this is all about relationship. This is all about intimacy, authenticity, incarnation, the great, the great dance. But w one of the things that we did is that we established separation. Separation becomes the hallmark of religion. Because think about it. What does a religious professional need in order to pay their mortgage? <laughs> how he said, how much time do we have? Well, they need a lot of things in order to pay their mortgage. But, but as far as theologically, and I'm talking about any religion on the planet, what are they going to need? They're going to need separation. We need an us versus a them. We need, and we need to be separated from God, or separated from perfectionism, or separated from an ideal, or separated from the divine, or separated from yourself, or separated from something, right? Because as soon as we can convince you you're separated, now we can become the experts in how to get you unseparated. And um, so, you know, so there's, there's, there's lots of ways to get you unseparated. So let's, um, in, our, in my modern evangelical heritage, and, and these are my people, and they're the ones that, that, on the spectrum of those who are mad at me, they would occupy a good 90-some percent, right? The secularists aren't mad at me. The New Agers aren't mad at me. The artists aren't mad at me. The uh, musicians aren't mad at me. The uh, scientists aren't mad at me. It's my people, right? And it's because, because I'm, I'm attacking the three things that are so, so significant. Separation, magic, and sacrifice. Because we have all three of them in Christianity as a religion. So we begin with separation. That is, you've sinned and you're separated from God, which was in the, the little pamphlet that Campus Crusade made. And, um, and uh, I, I was in Germany recently and I was doing an interview which turned out to be for an organization that was sponsored by Campus Crusade. And they had these, they, I wonder if I can pull it up really fast. They had these um, t-shirts, right? And, um, and you, could, you could buy the t-shirt, but I didn't know at that time that it was a Campus Crusade group. And um, so I'm just looking at the t-shirts going like, what does that mean? Because it was confusing to me. And because um, and they had different symbols on it. I got to pull this up if I can really quickly here. Um, because it is so funny and so telling. I'm almost there. Oh, you can do that? Yeah. Sweet. Oh, you're token millennial. All right. Cool, cool, cool. It's always good to have one of those around. I got a bunch of them. I got a bunch of them. So let's see if I can find this because I took the picture of the t-shirt just to make sure I'd get it. It's worth the wait, trust me. <laughs> the suspense is killing us. It's killing me too, just so you know. Oh yeah, almost there. Oh, I have to do it, yeah. Well, you can do that. Mm. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> oh, I wish, you know. I was hoping that they'd give me one. <laughs> Have any of you um, heard me talk about Martin Schleske, the violin maker? I got to spend a whole afternoon with him. At his shop, it was unbelievable. And um, you know, we're getting Der Klang, which is the sound. His book, The Sound. We're getting it translated into English. It should be out this fall. And um, but he's two books ahead of that now. And the stuff that he's working on. So we spend the afternoon with him, and um, going through his shop. And he lives, he lives in a house that's three hundred years old. 
and um, it's right in the center of Landisburg. And Landisburg is a town that survived because of two miracles that happened at the same time at the end of World War II. Um, the, uh, the house that he lives in traces its back, itself back to um, the, the women that were part of Teresa of Avila's community. And then this became their place in the city of Landisburg. And then it, it, it wasn't taken care of and it you know, was wearing down. But it shouldn't even be there. And, um, and what happened was that, that the uh, Americans, right at the end of the war, um, the Americans and the Brits, they sent an air raid to demolish Landisburg. It, that was their one target, all the bombers, right? So they sent the bombers uh, from and the high command had ordered that Landisburg be flattened. So they had sent all the bombers there. And there was a German commander on the ground in Landisburg. And he, he decided that the war was already over. Even though it had not been announced that it was over, even though it was, it, it was imminent, but it wasn't then. So he had all of his staff people put up white flags in central places all around Landisburg. And, um, and then the bombers started taking their diving run and they saw the white flags and, the, and the, the guy in charge of all the bombers, who, who was in one of the planes, the lead plane, he countermanded his direct order and decided not to bomb the city. And so those two things happened and those guys met years later and it's this amazing story of how they each made a decision to go against their commanding officers. And it's the reason why Landisburg is one of the few big cities that has all the architecture that has never been destroyed, including Ter Teresa of Avila's community's little house that now Martin Schleski um, resides in and has restored. And there's just a sense of history and... and sacred presence in, in that sense there. I can't find it. Okay, that was, that was there. Oh, I wanted to show you. My kids taught me how to make folders and then I can find things quicker. Yeah. I don't often do it. <laughs> I have, you want to do mine? I've only got 22,300 and... Yeah, can't find it. So I, but see, I need to, I need to see it to draw it. They had a different symbol for the four spiritual laws, and and uh, and one was a heart. You know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And I'm looking at it, not realizing that they're the four spiritual laws, and uh, the symbol for you sinned and and you're separated from God was this. Oh wow! Oh my God! Division. <laughs> A division sign, right? Oh, and, I, and I'm going, I go like, so I get love and I get Jesus as a crucifix, right? You know, because he's the one that builds the bridge, you know? And, um, and I, but what's this one? Oh, you've sinned and you're separated from God. Oh, this is the four spiritual laws. <laughs> you know? Did you find it? Yeah. Yeah, those are the four spiritual laws. And I didn't realize that. So there's, what are the four symbols? There's a, a heart, and then a div division, and then a cross, and then a question mark, which is, so what are you going to do about it? You know, like, you got to make a decision so you don't go to hell, you know? So those are the four symbols, and I'm, I'm totally naive. Go like, oh, my people. I'm right here with my people. Hey, Paul, I have a question about separation for you. Yeah. So, so um, I think I know how you'd answer all so, is, was there a real separation that wow. in the Incarnation, Christ does shatter the wall of separation? Or it, has that always been a delusion? See, and I'm getting there. Okay. So, we'll get there. Okay. And I think that's, a, that's absolutely an essential theme. And I think that Scripture is full of a response to that. And the Incarnation is a response to that. And to, to just tell you up front, 
separation is phenomenological. It is existential. It's not real. It is not a, but the delusion is so real to us that we lose ourselves in that delusion. But it's not actually real. But because we believe that it's real, we create religion that needs separation. And so what we did, in my people, I'm speaking for my people, what we did is that we, we had God create creation separate from God's self. Like in our minds, and this is where Baxter uses the soap bubble. You have the wand with the soap and you dip it in. This is God. And he blows creation out there somewhere. No, we, don't, we never ask the question, where's out there? You know, I, I was with a young man in Germany, and he, again, my people, because, and you can tell when you're in a conversation with my people, because they can't stay on one question. The, as soon as you start to go to any depth inside that question, they'll go to a new one. And, and so I said, I only have one. I said, if you answer this question for me, then I will answer your questions. Where was creation created? And he's like, what do you mean where? I said, no, just like where? Where is creation created? I said, if you can answer me that question, then I'll talk to you about your questions. <laughs> Where? So, um, so we did that. We said it was blown outside. And so you have two separate circles, right? You have the circle of God and you have the circle of creation. Well, guess what? Creation screws itself up, thanks to Adam. And he just messes up the whole universe. And because this is the cosmos over here, God's here. So what does God do? God sends Jesus over here, right? And he comes over from the God side over to the creation side. And uh, because you've sinned and you're separated from God, which is not in Scripture, by the way, but it sounds like it should be. You know, for my people, it's as good as being in Scripture because it sounds like it should be, <laughs> right? So what does Jesus do? Jesus builds a bridge back to God. How? By being the sacrifice. You should make tracks. I might. It needs to be in the shape of a cross, though. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, we'll put the sacrifice in the shape of a cross. Or the bridge in the shape of a cross, like this. There we go. There we go. Thanks. There we go. Somebody needs to take a photo of this. Okay. See, but we, we have to be careful because you don't, want, you don't want this part of the bridge to be an impediment halfway across because now we have, yeah, viewing stations. <laughs> viewing stations, yeah. Looking at the abyss. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so we've got, we've got separation, right? And, and we've got sacrifice. What are we missing? Ooh, okay, let's come up with some magic. How, how do we get from here to over here? Magic. Magic. Magic words. Magic words, like abracadabra. No, it's already taken. Um, what is it? Jesus, come into my heart. That's it. That's it. We'll call it what? The sinner's prayer. All right? So that's our magic, sinner's prayer. Sinner's prayer. You know that it didn't really exist until, I think it was 1940s or that, you know? So it's not very old. It's like, sorry for all those people before, because, <laughs> you know, they didn't have the advantages that we do. Right. That's another one that they don't believe is not in Scripture. I know. My people think that the sinner's prayer is in Scripture somewhere. Romans 2, 9 and 10. One translation. If you confess with your mouth, ah. Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. Okay. Right? Yeah. Let's talk about it. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Okay, Brad, help us out with this one. We, we had a song of that. Romans 10 and 9 is a favorite verse of mine. <laughs> if you confess with your mouth. And that's all we got. That's all we got. <laughs> if, if. If. So talk to us about if. No, I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> You've talked about this. The Romans 10 passage. I don't remember how you... Um, I'm not being stubborn. 
No, 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 I, I understand. I'm having one too, so that's why I'm trying to lay it on you. <laughs> I'll give you, I'll, I'll throw something in there. Yeah. For the word is not far from you. It is on your lips and it is in your heart. Which is in your, which is a follow-up verse. But for follow-up verse. Yeah. So um, also look up Romans uh, 8.28, which is you've sinned and uh, that's where they get, you've come short of the glory of God, right? Romans 3.23. Look at 24. Uh, all, all doesn't mean all, not to my people. <laughs> yeah, all those who would confess with their mouths and, you know, so, so all. So part of, part of what Brad has helped me with is that when you look at a passage like this, or you look at um, the sheep and the goats, or you look at uh, um, um, the rich man and Lazarus, all that, there is a context to it that's bigger than just the passage itself. And that context includes the entire New Testament and the entire incarnation and everything that's been done. So if you come up with an idea of what this means that, that violates the context, which would be the incarnation and the finished work of Jesus, mm -hmm. then you've got a problem with your interpretation. And, and I think, if I remember right, it has to, uh, this passage has to do with the term of if being conditional. Mm -hmm. And it's not. It's, it's um, since. Or, and it has a sense of not a transaction, but it's something that emerges from the inside out. I'll give you the... the uh, I have a quick example of that. Okay. If God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, yeah. Isn't like, oh, God might be for you. Right? It's, it's, it's since, since God, God is, God for, is you. for you. Who can be against and, us? and the Greek is like that. The Greek, you should most of the time translate that, that word in the Greek as since. Yeah, and not if. Yeah, that particular passage I had written in my notes here says this was also a confession that Rome required of their conquered enemies. Mm. 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 Interesting. Here's another one. John 1 12, which is always the one that comes up in conversations with my people. Um, uh, uh, to them he gave the power to become sons, uh, children of God. As many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, or children of God, all right? And that sounds conditional too. It sounds like if then, transaction. Mm -hmm. But the Greek's not like that. The Greek is, and, and the, the, key, the key word in this passage is exousia. Exousia. And that's the word authority or power. To them he gave authority or power, right? Exousia. But you know what that word means? Ek, it's ek, really, out of. Uzia is being. Out of, out of your own being. So again, it's the same as Paul is saying, Christ was revealed in me. So as many as agreed, and it's not received, it's, it's, it's an agreement that this is true, to them he gave the out of their own being to be the children of God. So it's like the emergence of the truth of your being from the inside out, that that's who you are. Like not you're agreeing, with your true self. you're agreeing with your true self. You're agreeing with God about your true self, out of your own being. So exousia is the key, the key phrase, the key word in that passage, out of your own being. Um, because, not by uh, crossing over on not, the ladder, yeah, but not emerging from within. Correct, correct. Oh, well, because we're going to say in a second that the assumption, this whole thing is based on a false assumption. 1001. This whole thing is based on a false assumption. I said we were going to say it in a second, so I thought I'd better do it. <laughs> so it is. And, the, and the, the false assumption is separation. And the false assumption is that creation is somehow, somewhere outside of God. Creation's not outside of God. Everything in the New Testament tells you where creation is created. John 1, 3. Not anything that has come into being has come into being apart from Him. Right? How about Colossians 1, 16 and 17? Everything that is created, the visible as well as the inv invisible, was created in Him. So instead of, instead of this... This,
we have this relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in, in the Son, and that's a circle, that's a dance, but creation is created in Him, in the Son. This is why I say you will not meet a person who's not in Christ. Because all of creation is created in, in Christ. And some people will say, well, the, but then there are those who are like in, in. Mm. Right? Your people. My people. <laughs> they go like, they're in, in. Like there's a second sal salvation or something. Yeah, there's like, yeah. And so, but again, uh, the, the early church and the New Testament are in agreement that all of creation is created in Christ. Period. There is no outside. In fact, they would say that if you're not in Christ, you will lapse into non-being. Because the reason you move and live and have your being in Him is because if you're not in Him, you don't exist. He's being itself. He is being itself, yes. All things hold together is now sustained, held together for Him, by Him, through Him, and in Him. In him. Right? Um, I, we spend a long time in a conversation uh, with Baxter and Brad Jerzak and me and, and uh, Kenneth Tanner and John McMurray and all this about, about this question about sin. And, and, and I, I brought up, I'm the one that brought up the question because of uh, Francois de Toit's translation in the Mirror Bible, where he takes... Um, uh, let me use the English, the anglicized version here. Um, so, uh, and, and hamartia, uh, which is usually translated missing the mark, right? That is normally how it's looked at, missing the mark, which is what it actually means in a sense. But the question is, what mark? Yeah. And... And what Francois does is he says, ha is a negation, like dis or un, something that negates something, right? And martia comes from meros, which means origin, form, or being, right? Ha martia. So that which negates origin, form, or being. That which negates the truth of who you are. Whatever it is. It can be religious. It can be non-religious. When you lie, you are negating the truth of your being as a truth teller because you're made in the image of God and created in Christ. Right? Going back to, I'm sure, what you heard uh, from Katie in terms of your essential nature being the Imago Dei. The, you're made in the image and likeness of God. Is God a liar? No. Therefore, the truth of who you are is that you're not a liar. Now, as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. So if you believe the lie that you're a liar, you will function like one. Right? So again, sin becomes anything that negates the origin, form, or being. And yes, I am comfortable with the relational language for it because everything's relational. Everything comes down to relational realities. Knowing, loving, trusting. And, and here's, a, here's another thing. You can, you can substitute the word in the English translation, believe, for the word trust and be accurate to the Greek. And it will change the way you read the New Testament. Because we are so locked into our cognitive, rational, <coughs> Western enlightenment thinking that we think everything functions from the head, which is part of my argument against my people who want to hold on to total depravity. I said, so where did you come up with that idea? Say that again, which word did you substitute? Believe. Believe for trust. With trust. Okay. Yeah, in fact, there is a one translation that's done that with the book of Hebrews. They took every time the word believe is used in Hebrews and changed it, pistis, to a trust, trust. And it changes it, because it now becomes a whole person relational response rather than a cognitive intellectual one. Because we've made that 
transaction happen at our head level, right? And so there is no separation. So where did the mythology of separation come from? And this is my argument, that it comes from Adam. And when does it happen? Before Eve is even withdrawn out of him. And here's the fundamental question. Is anything that is not good or not beautiful, does anything that is not good or not beautiful originate in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No. No. Either God is good all the time and, it, and, is, and is love and only love, period, and good, period, or if there's any shadow of turning with God, then we've got an entirely different universe. Right? But no, nothing that is not beautiful, and, and Brad was telling me that in the Septuagint, that when they translated, you know, in the passage in Genesis, it, it's, it, was, it was good, it was good. Animal creation, the physical creation is good. It's, they translate it beautiful. They use the word beautiful. And, and so it's beautiful. It was and they get to human creation, it was very beautiful. Right? And why beauty then becomes um, in conflict with that which is not origin of form or being. So, so the, the missing the mark of our identity, missing the mark of the relational integrity that exists inside of love, you know, that's all sin. Rather than some kind of behavioral, we, if we move it to moralism, then we end up with the law. And there's no way, you know, that's a very different thing to say, you got to stop whatever, you know, whatever the habit that we are against at the moment. You got to stop doing that. So you got to use self-discipline or whatever to stop it. No, no. Let me tell you, you are actually functioning according to a lie. When you say, I'm just an impatient person, you are actually lying. I mean, you are agreeing with a lie. You are negating your origin, form, or being. Right? And that's an easy one. How about this one? Pure of heart and self-controlled. See, that's the truth of who you are. But a lot of us, because shame has dominated our lives, we don't believe that. And that we've substituted self-discipline because discipline is some work of the flesh that comes from the outside in. It's the work of the false self, yeah? Comes from the outside in. These things, all the fruit of the Spirit, originate from the inside out. Rivers of living water from the inside out. Guess what? The kingdom of God is where? In you. In you. So this is all movement from the inside out. Pure of heart, self-controlled. You know, those are all things that come from the inside out. But if, if you think the truth of your being is that you're totally depraved and a piece of shit, you don't believe these things about you. How could you? Right? You should be ashamed of yourself. You know? That's just pride. No. We're talking about things that are true. This will destroy the addiction to porn by itself. These, the revelation of that by itself will destroy the addiction to porn. Because porn is the imagination of a relationship, right? Without the risk of a real one. And, and, and infatuation is relational porn. Infatuation, by the way. And the word for, the Greek word for infatuation is eros. We have um, baptized it, sort of. You won't find eros in scripture, by the way. The scripture doesn't recognize eros as legit. In fact, the, it was a demonic god in the Greek pantheon of gods. And, the, and the, the whole goal of eros was to pull you out of yourself by your emotions so that you experience such a high that you were outside of your mind. Right? Eros. And I don't know if any of you have ever been infatuated with someone. Infatuation is based on not knowing. Right? All it is is a projection of your own need through another, in this case, a person. You understand how similar to this is porn? Right? It's not, it's not just a, a flat image of someone. It is a human being. And now you're doing exactly the same thing. 
Because it's not about knowing that person. It's about imagining that that person is who you want them to be and likes you, right? Loves you, right? So it's the imagination of a relationship. And it's an imagination of being loved and being seen by someone. The thing about infatuation that you know that it's, that it's not real is because as soon as you start to get to know them, suddenly the emotions begin to dissipate, right? They begin to just evaporate. And it's like, now what? And I, I know people who got married because of infatuation and woke up on the other side of the honeymoon going like, what the hell, you know? And, and now what, you know? So again, infatuation is not real. Uh, all the language in the scriptures, in the Septuagint, when it, um, in the Vulgate, when it translates the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures into Latin, but all the language is agape language, even in Song of Solomon. It's agape. It's not eros. And, um, and we've sort of said, well, that's the sexual side. No, it's not. Sexuality is supposed to be knowing, right? That's the word that's used, that he knew, he knew her husband and, and they got pregnant, right? It's, it's knowing language. It's face-to-face -face language of intimacy and relationship not separation. See, and we, we've even um, created our, our, some of our liturgy based on this idea of separation. We think that the further we put God away, the more grand God becomes. It's totally contrary to the Incarnation, right? Worship actually happens the more you get to know the person, not how far away from the person you are. Right? But a lot of our concept of God being holy is to push God farther and farther away. Look how grand he is. And then the high and lift it up. Yeah, high lift it up. <laughs> and, and, you know, and there is that element that's, even though there's no fear in love, the fear of the Lord, right? But that's different. That's this respect and reverence. But it happens most fundamentally because of the incarnation. That is God coming to us. In intimacy, I mean, how much, how intimate do you want? Like a baby, right? And, and we get to know him. So all the language is relational uh, violation of separation language. And worship comes from the deeper and deeper you get to know the person. And the truer, even in our, in our relationships, in my relationship with Kim, we're going to be 40 years in September. And a lot of you know all of my story stuff. But there is an increasing depth of, of love that continues to expand around the knowing. Right? I did that in the shack, in, that, um, in the cave scene, when, when Sophia says, which one, you, which one of your children do you love the best? The most, you know? And he got caught by that. And it's like, how do I, how, I can't respond to that. I, they're not in a competition here, you know. And, uh, and, and, it's, and she, Sophia says something to the effect of, it's not love that grows, it's, it's knowing that grows, and love simply is the skin of knowing. So that as knowing expands, love continues, and it feels like, oh, love is growing. No, it's knowing that is growing. And that is true, in terms of our, you can track your history with relationship to God, and the more you've gotten to know God and the truthful, the true reality of God's character and nature, the sense of love has grown in you, yes. right? And that's our existential experience. The yeah. sense of uh, the, the sense of of love expands to. Um, uh, it's ex I said it's existential. It's how we, f we experience God. Is that love, we will say, well, I love him more today than I did. Well, you know him more. And love simply was the skin of knowing. That's what I was trying to do inside, inside that language. You had a question. Um, I just had a comment. Yeah, please. So this morning I was uh, dwelling on this idea of not coming before the cross as a piece of shit. Yeah. But coming before the cross and looking at and so as I was thinking about that, it radically changed my idea of what the Eucharist is. Yeah. So I think the Eucharist is not an examination of my sin or a purging of that which is ungodlike. 
but more it's a it's a dwelling in it's a meal it's a sharing it's a it's an agreeing with who he is and who he made me to be which, I, I love that which consequently turns you away from your sin correct that's the, it, it turns, turns you away from anything that would deny the truth of who you are thank you yes and it turns me away from, from that which is not God anything that is not of love's kind yeah the nourish it, it is the fruit Eucharist, thing of the Eucharist is the fruit of the tree of life. Mm. Paradise is reopened, we come to the cross and, and, and receive. We're allowed to eat the tree of life now. Mm -hmm. We're not blocked from that. Eh? And the, so that's at the cross yep. of the tree. Is that work, Paul? Yep, yep, absolutely. So, um, so, again, religion, you have to have separation to begin with. And, and we're saying there is no separation. You, you can't be separated. You were created in Christ. There's no separation. Um, so even, even if we got into the conversation about what hell and heaven are and all that kind of stuff, whatever hell is, it's got to be inside this circle. Revelation 14. Yeah. You want to expand? <laughs> well, there's just a place in Revelation that does say that the, the lake of fire and burning sulfur was in the presence of the Lamb and before the throne. Right. That's inside it this say it lasts forever, but it just says it's in the presence of the Lamb. And it's not separation. For, so we used to define it in my in my four spiritual laws days. Yep. Eternal separation. Yep. Eternal separation. Right. And Which that, that verse just completely negates. I mean, it's a direct denial of that. Yeah. So if there is two spheres of reality, God and then creation, then you could put hell over here along with all the other people that didn't make it across the bridge, right? Because they didn't make it across the bridge. Uh, because why? Because they didn't say the sinner's prayer. And, and they only had X amount of days to do it, depending on you know, how long they lived. Because th the, the drop-dead date mm -hmm. was a drop-dead date, <laughs> right? It's because as soon as you hit that date, I'm sorry, you, you died. There's nothing I can do for you now. Like, death wins, you know? And, oh, yeah, and we can, absolutely, we can talk about that because, you know, if they'd, have, if they'd have just been corrupt pagans before, you know, before the New Testament, Jesus would have gone down and got them, right? Because he goes and raids hell. I mean, the place of the dead, not hell, hell, but the place of the dead. So, separation, we needed it because that gave that gives job security to the whole institutional system. <laughs> well, it does. I mean, you know. So you, if you tamper with the idea of of union, and and that all creation is in Christ, so that when when the Son dies, all of creation in Him also dies, and when He rises, all of creation in Him rises. I'm quoting Corinthians, right? So. So that tampers with the idea of separation. And, and we need separation in order to, to justify the religion and the collection of money, which because institutional systems are not eternal. They exist because of money. Money is the blood of institutional systems, right? Not, not real blood. It's money. And so how, how do you keep an institutional system alive? You've got to have money. Institutional systems actually don't even exist except for human beings. Right? You take all the human beings out of an institutional structure and it just like it has less life than rocks. Right. So you got a comment and then a question here? Um, don't you think Paul that's the way to say it? So I don't want to put words in your mouth. Don't you <laughs> think? Do you think that it's more than just an institution? By that I mean, I'm, think, I'm thinking of Adam and Eve. They believe they're separated. There's no institution at that point. Yeah. They believe they're separated, and that's the reality that they live out of. Okay. I, and I would say Adam believes he's separated. Okay. I wouldn't say she does. She's... When they're hiding in the bushes, she, you still don't think she does yet? No. She's still deceived. Okay. Yeah. Because... No, but Adam does. Yeah. Um... 
But she, and she participates in it because as soon as their eyes are open, there's some sense of consciousness, but it's a consciousness. Yeah. So I'd say, yeah, she thinks that at that point. But, but I'm going to draw it back to Adam prior to her even being there. In this sequence of beautiful, 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 very beautiful, not beautiful, not good. When does that happen? And we already said, anything that is not good does not originate in God. So in this sequence, you hit the first not good in Scripture. What is it? Man's alone. Yeah, but not man as in generic man, Adam. Well, yeah. Okay, and, and, and when we read that, what do we see? We hear him like God going like, ah, oh, I, I messed up. Eve should have been here, right? Look, he's by himself. Well, the Hebrew has a construction for by yourself or solitude or however you want to say it. That's not this. In the Hebrew, it is not good that Adam be in his separation. Right? This is way bigger. I mean, this is not just a comment about, oh, she's not here. We need to do something about that. Because, it, because God's first response is not to bring her out of him. It's to bring him in front of all the animals. To, to look for uh, uh, power equal to him. We can get into all that language. But... But, um, but in this sequence, it is, is he separated? No. Is he alone? No. He's not. He is not alone. He is inside the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What did he mean then when he said it's not good that he's alone? In, that's where we're coming up with phenomenal logical language or existential language. It's not a declaration that he is actually alone. He, is, he has turned experiential, experiential right? He has, Experientially, he's alone. Yeah. yeah, in his own, he is he now... All the animals, they all well, are. he's not even got to the animals yet. So. This is before the animals. This so, is the... Go sometimes ahead. Sometimes we've, sometimes we've, in a technical way, way um, um, we've used these words, that, that there is no separation, but when you, in reality, but when you believe in separation, you experience real alienation. Correct. It's not that God's left you, it's that you think he's left you, and now you are really feel, experiencing alienation. So alienation is when you believe the delusion of separation. Perfect. And in my point is we create the institutions because we feel like that. Correct. Um, no. Correct. That's correct. Yes. To, uh, to Brad's point, Colossians 1, 21 or 22 says, and when you were enemies with God, not meaning God was your enemy, but you were had animosity towards God. It says you were alienated from God. Some translations say separated, but it says you were alienated from God in your mind. Mm -hmm. It says that where the alienation existed was internal. It's not an eight, not, 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 not ontological, not ontological. To be the beingness. It is not an actual, it's not real. Correct. Correct. And, and, and here's a good illustration, and, and some of you have heard this already. This is, this is how powerful our minds are, that we can create um, something that we absolutely believe to be real that is not. Right? And, and, um, and we have lots of different language for that. Paradigm is one of them. It's the lenses that we look at reality through. And uh, have, you, have you seen that thing on, it's on YouTube or whatever where they have the, the 15 years ago a psychologist did this unbelievably powerful experiment where, and you can watch it. It's got people in white hats and people in black hats or white shirts, shirts, right? White shirts, black shirts. And, and you're supposed to keep track of how many times the people in white throw a ball between each other. And you watch it, and you're counting the times, and they say, so how many times did they do it? Fifteen, I think is the right answer. And then they go like, well, did you see the gorilla? Like, what gorilla? And they say, well, watch it again. This time, don't count the, the times in the air. And sure enough, a gorilla walks right into the middle of the group, and he beats his chest, and, but he never interferes with the flight of the ball. So, so what they're saying is that... that our eyes see what they expect to see or want to see. They don't, and, they, and you're blind to everything else. Or told to see. Yeah, or you're told to see. Yeah. They were told to look. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and 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 until, and it's right there, right? And it's it's stunning that, or they did another one where they had a bar and somebody's being served at a bar, and um, the person says, "Can I have this?" She said, and the gal goes, "Yeah," and reaches down, disappears, comes up and serves, and and well, you. This is the mind games thing. Yeah. Well, they did it on mind games, but it was done by a psychologist okay. 15 years ago, and. And they go, did you realize that the person who was serving the drink changed from a woman to an African-American man? And you didn't. Wow. Right? How many glasses of wine? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on... Uh, it's you. It's you. It's you're watching this. It's not the person in the... Oh. In, yeah. It's The question is for you, right? So, and I, I've, I've told this story before. I've... We have a friend that came to Open Table, and she has um, a severe abuse history, right? And she, um, and some of you have probably heard this story, but she came up and said, I'll tell you how powerful a paradigm is. You know, the inner lenses that we have that negate all information that we don't want to know. And, um, and she said uh, when she was five years old till the time she was early teens, um, she would beg God and say, please, would you change the color of my eyes to blue? And it was because her father was an alcoholic and almost got drunk every night, and he'd go into a rage, and he would start cussing her out and saying these horrible things. And she, he always finished up with, you are so ugly, even the color of your eyes are the color of cat shit. That's what he would tell her. And so she prayed as a child, God, please change the color of my eyes to blue. And because and then maybe her dad would love her, you know. And she looks up and says, so what are the color of my eyes? And I'm looking into two beautiful blue eyes. And I'm going like, God changed the color of your eyes? I mean, that was my first thought. She goes, Paul, they were always this color. I just didn't know it until I was in my 30s. Right? And again, it's a, that's the power of our delusion. Now, if you take that word for, it's not good that he be separated. Separated from whom? Well, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now remember, eight times in the New Testament it says that sin, the negation of being or origin, entered the cosmos through one man. Adam. Right? Eight times in the New Testament. Both references to Eve say that she was thoroughly and completely deceived. He wasn't, right? So did, did sin enter through the woman? No. Did it enter through Satan? No. Through one man. When does it happen? Separation. When he believes, this, he turns his face away from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is free will evil? Free will evil? Yeah. It's creative. It's creative. There are four kinds, four things that God could have done in terms of creation. One, not create. Right? Two, create a mechanistic universe in which everything followed natural law or it's it's programming, right? A totally technologically yeah, a matrix. Except in matrix there's free will. Okay, third one is that he could have created a universe in which human beings thought they had free will but didn't actually. Truman yeah. Show. Yeah. No. Yeah. What? Truman, Truman Show. Good That's a really good analogy. So, but yeah, it's another movie. So, um, but that's the third way. The fourth way, and this is the universe we live in, is that he could create human beings who had the ability to say no. And our universe is the only kind of universe that God could create in which love and relationship was even possible. The other three, it's not. Because if you have no capacity to truly say no, you have no capacity to say yes, or your yes doesn't even matter. And we, 
we have a very low view of free will. And we know that will is coerced and all that kind of stuff by history and genetics and culture and media and everything else, yes. But we still have an ability to say no. We can say no to love and we can say yes to love. We can say no to, to trauma in terms of its effect on us. We can say yes to forgiveness. We can, I mean, our choices really matter. I mean, truly matter. And so when you create this, this human being inside of a relationship of light and love, and it's like, how? How could anybody be surrounded by the beauty of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and turn their face away? That in terms of scripture is called the mystery of iniquity. Because iniquity is different than trespass. Both trespass is to violate a law of some sort. And both Adam and Eve violate a law. They both trespass. But only Adam has ever, and Job says this, don't be like Adam who hid the iniquity in his heart. Right? There's a distinctiveness in terms of the culpability of Adam versus her. She is thoroughly and completely deceived. And this is why when God shows up, in that garden scene, there is completely different responses to Adam versus to her. To her is given the promise of one that through her would crush the head of the serpent, the accusation, right? Through Adam, he's expelled out of the garden because he's still in his rebellion. He has still turned his face away, right? So he is in his, what's another word for separation? Alienation. Uh, yeah, but there's a stronger word. You're getting there. How about death? How about death? Because if you turn your face away from life and you've separated yourself in your own delusion with regard to God who is life, it's you like have... unplugging from being. Yes. It's exactly like unplugging from being, although you don't actually do it. Because you can't, right. right? You can't. You cannot deny the fact that you are created in the image and likeness of God and that your existence is in Him, and in Him you live and move and have your being, mm -hmm. right? So you can't truly unplug. But He unplugs in His darkened imagination, uh. okay? So He turns away, so it's death or aloneness, or, you know, a whole bunch of other words. Um, the, the sense of separation. And that becomes, that becomes the enemy that Jesus is going to destroy. Mm -hmm. And how is he going to do that? How, if Jesus is going to destroy the delusion of separation, how is he going to do it? Because this is where we're lost. We're lost inside of death and aloneness, this is why Mother Teresa says, you know, the dominant disease of the West is loneliness, right? And think about this. Everything in our lives that is destructive to us drives us toward aloneness and separation. Lies, secrets, right? The inability to tell your story, shame, drives you toward aloneness, um, addiction, our justice system, you know, the, the more you do wrong, the more alone we're going to make you, right? That's how we're going to fix you. Is going to, what, our concept of hell is ultimate aloneness, banishment, right? Um, so everything that is in our world that drives us toward self-destruction, suicide, is an ultimate statement of aloneness or separation or disconnection. And, um, but everything that is beautiful and good moves us in the direction of relationship. Truth telling, authenticity, telling your story, you know, all of these, as scary as it is, you are counteracting shame, you're counteracting fear, because fear will drive you toward hiding and secrets and addiction and aloneness and everything else, right? But so this... Oh, in terms of what people do in response yeah. to it? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Therein lies the rejection, you know, yeah. by virtue of wherever they are and their lenses. 
Yeah. And at that point, again, we're talking our existential um, reality, not in terms of who we are in terms of our being. But authenticity won't self-alienate. No. Oh, alienate you from yourself. Correct. It, it's not, it's but their problem, it's, it's but it's their problem. It's not yours. Right? They're lost in, yes, you make it your in well, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. We yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, again, how is God going to defeat this? Because, see, we needed separation, we needed magic. That's how we got back here. Because, you know, magic is non-relational. Magic is just about power. If I got the right words, if I have enough faith, I can get God to do with whatever I want Him to do, right? I mean, we use magic a whole lot of different ways within Christianity. Yeah. Paul, every time when we turn away from truth and love, Yes. And we experience death because there is nothing else. It's not a punishment then. It's just a consequence. Correct. So the illusion that God is punishing us for it or that he is separate from us is just an illusion. <coughs> Cor nothing really has changed. I just turned my back on the light and that's why I experienced darkness. Yeah, and that's, I use that in, um, in, in Eve. Yeah, I use it in Eve where I'm trying to describe this, this, uh, alienation that happens existentially for Adam <laughs> and and I use the picture of God who is light you turn your back and now you cast a shadow and that shadow then becomes how you define God because Adam's already defined God as not good this is even before Eve has shown up and Adam is the one who brings the serpent in to make an accusation against God right Adam is with her when when the serpent attacks her with his accusation because when God shows up and says to Adam, what did you do? He said, the woman you gave me. See, it's the same accusation. You're not trustworthy. You're not good. I've already defined you in my shadow darkened mind as you're not good. You're not trustworthy. You're not love. That right? Before the serpent yeah. Yes. He's separated way before. Right? It is not. Oh, yes. Well, it, it makes, it says this, that the, he brings the serpent in from outside the garden and that's where he was created. He was created outside the garden. He was put in the garden. She is brought forth inside the garden, right? And, but the serpent is a creature from outside the garden. And, and that creature then declares Adam's accusation against the character of God. Because remember, it's through Adam. It's not through the serpent. It's not through... It's through Adam that sin enters the cosmos. <clears throat> through one man. This is why Jesus comes as a male to be the second Adam. Right? Because he's got to go to the place of greatest loss. And he's got to deal with Adam's alienation. Adam's separation. And this is part of the argument of Romans 5. If Adam was able to in affect the entire cosmos, you think Jesus is less powerful than Adam? That's Romans 5's argument, Galatians 3. So in this scenario, Adam's turning has already happened before, you know, uh, before anything. And he, ref he is not relating to God face to face to face. He has turned his face away. And so God does what? Here, look at the animals. Can you find somebody that you can talk to face to face? And he doesn't find a face to face among the animals. Right? It makes that point. And he says, So I'm going to bring out from within you someone who will be a power face to face with you. A help, it's a word that's only used for women and God, right? He is my present help in time of trouble, is the same word as in, in the Genesis passage. A help face to face, a power equal to you, face to face, to do what? to call you back to your humanity, to keep you from lapsing into non-being, and which is something that women and children have done ever since the beginning, have called men back to their humanity. Because the turning away of Adam was different than the turning away of Eve. Eve does turn, and she is warned about it. Uh, you look, Genesis 3, Adam is the only one expelled from the garden. And it tells you that three times. 
But our mythology has so put a pair of glasses on us and our art followed along. You see Adam and Eve with Eve under the arm of Adam. They're both in shame. There's a big angel with a big sword. That's insane. Yeah, and they're being expelled out of the garden together. In the Genesis 3 passage, it tells you three times that he is singular male. He is expelled out to, to work the ground from which he was brought, right? Which is outside the garden. And to her is given a warning, your teshuka, your turning. The Hebrew word is teshuka. The Greek Vulgate translation is epistrophe, which means to turn. Your turning will be to the man, and he'll rule over you. So when, at some point, she leaves Eden, to do what? Well, she got this promise, right? She's got this promise that through her will come the seed of the woman who will crush the accusation. Well, how can that happen without a man? I mean, impossible, right? And so she, the implication is if she'd have stayed in the garden, she could have been Mary. That through her specifically would come, right? But she turns, she follows. You know, part of the reason that I know this is true, she thought Cain was, her, was the Savior. When it says in the Hebrew, and she cried out with a loud voice and says, I have begotten a man-child, the Lord. In the, in the English, they didn't know how to deal with that, so they put, with the help of the Lord. Right? Just but added the words. they added the words because that's what we do when Scripture doesn't you know, yeah. relate to our, our paradigm. So they just put them in there. But in the Hebrew, it's, I've begotten a man-child, the Lord. She thought Cain would be the salvation for not only her, but for her husband as well. And when she has her second baby, Abel, Abel means sighing or hope is fading. Right? So she is experiencing, oh, but here, she at least turns to a relationship, right? Which is a lot more like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does Adam do? He turns to the creation inside. And what are they turning from? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Life, light, freedom, joy, goodness, right? And, and where does she look for it? Where does she look for identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, community, love? Her turning, Teshuka, epistrophe, her turning. We know from that it was Pagnino in the Middle Ages that changed that word to desire. It was never desire was always translated turning, okay? And epistrophe in the Vulgate is to turn. And teshuka means to turn in the Hebrew. So it's only used three times. It's used when um, sin is to, to the warning to Cain. Remember, God goes out there with them, you know? You, you can't separate yourself. So even though Adam has broken the, the universe, God is with him, right? And uh, with Cain, the warning of God is like, Sin is crouching at the door, and it's turning us toward you. And, um, and so it's like, be aware. So, the, um, um, that, so what does the man turn to? The ground and the works of his hands. And what does he do it for? Identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, community, and love. So we then create institutions, not just religious, but economic and also political, that are trying to enact the power that is centered in our turning to the ground and the works of our hands for identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose. And we enact separation left, right, and center, right? And so we're now opposed to anyone that can take this ground from me. This is where wars begin, where violence happens, the killing of, of Abel by Cain. It's, uh, we're now in competition. And on and on it goes. So the woman is turned to the man, at least it's relational. The man didn't even do that. He turns to the ground. And when you turn to a man and he cannot provide what only God can, identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, community, and love, you're going to get fight or flight. You turn to the man and he will rule over you. Right? So what's the history of the male side of the conversation been? Largely, we leave or we fight, right? And so the call of the gospel is what? Return.
return. Return. That's the big, huge call. Return. Come back. Turn your face to me. I want to see you face to face. I want to tell you the truth of who you are. Right? And so the, the man, he looks to the ground. The ground goes, I'm not God. Thorns and thistles. Good luck. You know? And so it's like you, you're going to find thorns and thistles when you look to your identity in the ground and the works of your hands. Right? And now, men have created their identity in the ground and the works of their hands, their territory and their property. They use violence to get it in the first place and then they baptize it and turn it into a religion. You know, a nationalism or Americanism or Canadianism or whatever. And, um, and then we, you know, create hymns and we have a sacrificial system. We, we sacrifice our kids to do what? Safety, security, all those things that only God can truly give you. 